Uh, the second invited talk of this conference will be given by Roger Dingledine. Roger is the uh, president, uh, director, and co-founder of the TOR organization. And um, uh, TOR, in case you don't know, is a widely used system for uh, ensuring online privacy. Uh, Roger? Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Roger Dingledine I'm from the TOR project, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the software that we've been working on and the project that we've been working on. So there are a lot of different topics that I'm going to try to cover today. Uh, I'll try to mash in several talks into one talk, so uh, hopefully everybody will find something they're interested in, and I'll be around for uh, the rest of the conference wearing a bright green shirt so you can chat with me more if you have any more questions. So the basic idea of Tor is it's a program that you can get and install and run on your computer. And the idea is that you can browse the web or connect to other TCP uh, sites where somebody watching you locally can't figure out where you're going, somebody watching the website end can't figure out where you're coming from, and some person participating in the middle of the infrastructure can't link you to where you're going. So those are the three main uh, anonymity goals that we're working on. So in a, a bigger picture, Tor is a variety of things. Tor is that software I was just talking about. It's also the Tor network. There are about 2,000 or 3,000 volunteer relays around the world right now who are relaying traffic for hundreds of thousands of Tor users. So we have an overlay network that's actually deployed and uh, much larger than Planet Lab. Uh, and it's also the Tor protocol. We have specifications that say this is how you can do uh, your own Tor client or your own Tor relay. And several other groups around the world have built their own compatible Tor clients. Uh, I really recommend multiple implementations. Uh, I can tell you more stories about that later. So one of the neat things about Tor is the community of different people around the world. Pretty much every city I go to these days, there's some university who has grad students doing Tor research. So there are maybe 50 or 100 people, uh, grad students, professors, all around the world who are working on Tor research right now. So part of my goal is to teach them what the real problems are so that they can uh, be more likely to solve mine. Uh, and then we've got developers and users uh, all around the world. Another interesting thing about Tor is the diversity of funding that we've had over the years. So we started out funded by the US Department of Defense. And then we were funded by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF. So even from that first step, we've got uh, two completely different groups who uh, never really think that they have anything in common. But in fact, what they have in common is they both want this security or privacy or anonymity online. And from there, we were, founded, we were funded by another uh, US government group called the International Broadcasting Bureau. You haven't heard of them, but you've probably heard of Voice of America or Radio Free Asia, stuff like that. So they have some websites that some people around the world can't reach, and they want to fix that. It turns out, once you've built an anonymity system, meaning somebody watching the user can't figure out what destination they're going to, then you're also part way to a circumvention or anti-censorship system where somebody watching the user can't decide which websites they're allowed to reach and which ones they're not allowed to reach. So that is one version of Tor. Another version of Tor is we're uh, an actual 501c3 nonprofit American corporation. Uh, we were founded in 2006. We fund something like 10 or 15 people, mostly developers, to work on Tor. So we've got two main goals as an organization. The first goal is I want to build software to keep everybody in the world safe on the internet for all definitions of safe. And once I'm done with that, the second goal is I want to teach everybody in the world what it means to be safe and how to evaluate things like that. So right now we've got instructions saying look for the lock in your web browser and then you know you're safe and uh, there's more work to be done there. <laughs> so we've got some number of users, um, over 100,000, less than a million, uh, maybe 400,000 or something of Tor clients running right now. It's an anonymity system, so it's a little bit hard to count uh, exactly how many users we have. <laughs> so let's look at this from the threat model perspective. So we've got Alice over here. She's trying to browse the web or something like that. And we've got Bob. Where can the adversary be? The first issue, the adversary could be watching Alice. Maybe that's Alice's ISP. Uh, maybe this is the uh, Tunisian telephone company monitoring all of its citizens. Uh, maybe it's Starbucks. Uh, or maybe the adversary is watching Bob. Maybe they're really watching indie media, so they want to know who's connecting there. Or they're watching Gmail because uh, they're colluding with China. Or they're watching WikiLeaks because they really want to know who's publishing there. Uh, or maybe the adversary is Bob. 
Maybe it's CNN.com and they want to know who all their users are so they can advertise to them better. Um, or maybe the adversary is somewhere in the middle. Maybe it's AT&T or some other large backbone provider. So if the adversary is in all of these red boxes, we're screwed. We can't protect against that. So I guess this is, uh, I've, I've heard from a lot of crypto people who use the phrase threat model to define exactly the funny shaped adversary that provably cannot defeat their system. Uh, so in our case, our threat model is the actual adversary that we expect to see in practice. And uh, I'll explain later on why we can't uh, defeat somebody who's watching all of these different places. So anonymity is not encryption or integrity or other stuff. Uh, a lot of, I talk to a lot of corporations who say, I use a VPN, so I don't, I don't need anonymity. I'm all set, thanks. And encryption is good. You should use encryption. But even when you're using encryption, somebody watching your traffic gets to learn who you're talking to, how much you're saying, when you're talking. And that's what all the intelligence agencies use to try to break these things these days. Nobody actually goes after the crypto. It's all about, let's build the social network and let's figure out who that person in the middle is, the one that talks to a lot of people and hears from a lot of people, and then let's break into his house and take his computer or whatever the next step is. And there are other variations on what anonymity is or isn't. Uh, there are a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, designs on the internet that are based on plausible deniability. The idea is, yeah, you asked me for the file, and yeah, I gave you the file, but it might not have been me. I might have been relaying it for somebody else. You can't prove it was me. So there are a couple of problems there. One of them is, uh, what about the 40th time you're the one involved in that transaction? And each time you say, well, you can't prove it was me this time either. Uh, statistically, that starts to look a bit weird. Uh, the other issue is, uh, imagine you're a group of journalists in Burma, and they've lined up five people, and they're pretty sure it's one of these five, but they can't prove which, five, which, which one of the five it is. That's bad news for all five of them. So I want something uh, where you can't even start to narrow down uh, which user you should be investigating more. And then there are a bunch of commercial single hot proxy systems out there. Uh, there was one called SafeWeb long ago, Anonymizer. There are a bunch of different examples. Uh, and the idea is it's one computer somewhere and it proxies all the traffic for people. And they say, we promise we won't look at any of the traffic. OK, OK, w we look at all of it. We promise we won't write anything down. We won't log anything. OK, OK, w we log everything. We promise we won't tell anybody what we see. I don't know what the fourth line is, but I want something stronger than that. I want something that's not based on trust. So I was talking to the uh, chief technical officer of one of these uh, anonymizer companies a while ago, and he was saying, we never answer subpoenas. If we ever answered a subpoena, none of our users would trust us ever again. So of course we never answer subpoenas. And then I was doing a talk for the US Department of Justice, and partway through, one of them interrupted me and said, why can't you be like anonymizer? It's great. We send them a subpoena. They send us an answer. It's great. Why can't you be like that? So I don't want to pick on any particular companies, but uh, the point there is in that centralized model, you have to trust them with your anonymity. And I'd like a design that's decentralized in a way that uh, as long as the design is working, there's no single organization that promises to keep you safe. OK, so I actually only use the word anonymity when I'm talking to other researchers. When I'm talking to my parents and grandparents, I tell them I'm working on a privacy system. Because anonymity is a bit weird, but privacy is a good American value. And when I'm talking to companies like Google and Walmart and so on, I work on communication security or network security. Because anonymity is bad news. Privacy is dead. I think that's. Uh, Maybe it was the Oracle guy who said that. But communication security, you're right, I do need that. And when we're working with uh, the Naval Research Lab and law enforcement and militaries and governments, we work on traffic analysis resistant communication networks, <laughs> which, again, are all the same security properties. It's the same system that everybody's using. But the goal is to figure out how to phrase this for different communities so they all realize that this is the sort of uh, network they want to use. This is the sort of security properties that they're missing. And then the fourth category that I'm going to be uh, talking about more today is the uh, human rights activist or journalist side, where for them, they don't mind the fact that uh, they can reach their destination safely. But for them, it's about reachability. It's about, I couldn't get to BBC, and now using tools like this, I can. 
Okay, so there are a bunch of different examples of why individual citizens and so on care about this sort of thing. I'm going to mostly skip over that so that I get to some of the more interesting stuff. So here are a few examples. Uh, maybe your insurance company uh, wants to learn about your browsing habits so that they can change your insurance premiums. Uh, maybe your ISP is collecting all of your click logs and selling them. Most ISPs actually are doing that right now. They just don't admit to it very loudly. Uh, businesses also use Tor. Uh, maybe you want to check out the competition's website without letting them know uh, which company is investigating them. Uh, what are your engineering department's favorite search terms? Google knows. Lots of other people know. Is that the sort of thing that you want to be broadcasting everywhere? Law enforcement uses Tor. I do a bunch of talks to FBI to try to teach them that I'm not actually the reason why their job is hard. And after each of these talks, one of them comes up to me and says, I use Tor every day for my job, thank you. So part of our uh, goal here is to get all these different communities into the same network so that they can blend together. And then governments also use Tor. Uh, what would you bid for a list of Baghdad IP addresses that get email from .gov addresses? Does anybody else out there want that sort of information? Uh, what does the FBI Google for? Lots of examples there. And then uh, more to today's topic, journalists and activists also need this sort of thing. Uh, for example, let's say uh, you're in Iran and they're monitoring uh, all of the users to s connect out and they say, are you the one who just posted to that blog? Because uh, we're trying to figure out who is making comments or who's, who's running that blog discussion. Uh, or maybe the website end is monitored. Uh, there's a, a scary example where, so everybody here know about livejournal.com, I hope? Sounds good. So LiveJournal is a popular blogging platform, and it has a thriving Russian activist community. So if you live in Russia and you want your country to be different, you're on LiveJournal talking about making a difference. So a few years ago, a really rich guy in Moscow bought all of the ads on LiveJournal, which means every time you load any page on LiveJournal, you tell Moscow who you are and which page you're loading. And nobody really cared about that. And then a few years later, some other really rich guy in Moscow bought the company. So now the KGB operates the company in which the Russian activists are trying to coordinate. And they can't build the activation energy to move off. So that's kind of a sad story. Um, another example is yahoo.cn. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a user who had a yahoo.cn email address uh, from inside China. And China went to Yahoo and said, tell us who this user is because we want to make them a better citizen. And <laughs> Yahoo said, why, of course. You are a government. We follow the laws of all governments. Here's your user. And then a bunch of people in the US got angry about that. And now there's sort of a shift out of keeping your servers in China. Now they're in Taiwan or Hong Kong or Singapore or something. Uh, I imagine eventually we're all going to creep back so that all the servers are in Iceland. I'm not sure how to solve that particular problem. <laughs> okay, so the big picture is you can't get anonymity by yourself. I remember talking to IBM long ago and they said, well, this is great, but I want to run my own anonymity system where only IBM people use it. And that means that anybody who pops out of that system, you know they're an IBM person. So the goal is to blend them all together uh, so you can't tell whether it's a, an FBI person or a Russian activist or an American citizen or, or so on. So far, so good? Okay, and bad people need anonymity too. But if you're willing to break the law, there are a lot of other ways of staying safe on the internet. So a brief taxonomy of bad people, which is a separate talk. You start with your Trojans and your viruses and your exploits, and from there you break into millions of computers, and from there you profit. So I, I periodically talk to law enforcement who say, but what about terrorists? Terrorists could use your tool, and you're enabling them. So let's take a step back. Scenario one. I want to build a tool that works for a million people. It's going to work a year from now, and I can tell you how it works so you can help me evaluate it. That's Tor's problem. The bad guy problem is I want to build a tool that's going to work for 15 people for the next two weeks, and I'm not going to tell you about it. There are a lot more ways of solving scenario two. So the, the story about the 9-11 hijackers was somebody walked into an internet cafe, uh, I'm sorry, somebody walked into a library, they logged into their Hotmail account, they drafted an email, but they didn't send it, then they walked out. Somebody else walked into a different library, logged into the same Hotmail account, pulled up the draft, no email was sent, so no email was logged, 
There are a million little tricks like that. I go to eBay and start a flame war. I mean, there are a lot of different ways of communicating if nobody knows what the plan is. So the goal for Tor is to build something that scales, that we can be transparent about, and that's going to work for a long time. Um, so the current situation is the bad guys are doing great on the internet, and the good guys have very few options. So I'd be happy to chat more about that one uh, later on. If you're one of those ooh, 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 Tor is for bad people, uh, people I'd be happy to talk to. OK, so how do you actually build one of these? Uh, the simple answer is you have that computer, the central centralized proxy, and all of the users go to it. If they're very lucky, they use SSL or some sort of encryption, so somebody watching Alice doesn't learn her destination immediately. Uh, but the bad news there is, what about that central point of failure? There, there are all sorts of ways that a single point of failure, subpoena, uh, maybe you bribe the CEO, maybe he sells the company, maybe somebody breaks in. But it's actually worse than that. Uh, generally, there's one cable going into that computer, and it's the same cable coming out. And if I can monitor that traffic, for example, I run the co-location building or something, uh, or I am AT&T, or uh, all sorts of other examples. If I can see the traffic coming in and the traffic going out, then very simple statistics lets me match up incoming flows to outgoing flows. And at that point, I, I, I break all of the anonymity of all the users, because I say, this flow has these certain timing and volume characteristics, and this flow has matching timing and volume characteristics, so I'm a winner. So the goal of Tor is to distribute the trust over multiple relays, so no single relay gets to learn about both Alice and Bob. So that means if R1 is bad, he knows Alice is using Tor, but he doesn't know where she's going. He doesn't know about Bob. And if R3 is bad, he knows somebody is talking to Bob, but he doesn't know who. And if they're both bad, then we lose, because then they can match things up. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in a bit. So there is crypto, but I'm going to mostly gloss over that for this talk in hopes of uh, talking about some of the broader issues. So the basic idea is Alice is going to learn about the relays in the network and their keys. And then she's going to connect to R1 and establish a, a session key, an ephemeral session key. And then she's going to, through R1, tunnel her connection to R2 and establish a session key with R2. And then tunnel to R3 and establish a third session key. And at this point, she has the ability to encrypt to any of these relays in a way that the other relays can't read it. And from there, she can say, please connect me to CNN or please connect me to BBC, um, stuff like that. So, I should point out here that in the crypto literature, there's a discussion of a, a concept called onion routing, which has been mixed up with the phrase mixed net. So once upon a time, uh, there was a paper from David Chaum in 1981, which said, uh, you've got your mix, and a bunch of Alice's send in messages, and the mix waits until there are a pile of messages, and then you decrypt them, permute them, send them out in a different order, and nobody watching the mix can figure out which incoming message corresponds to which outgoing message. So onion routing is different in a couple of ways. The main difference is uh, we have traffic streams rather than messages which means that one of these Alice's is asking for the front page of CNN, and this other Alice is trying to download an iTunes uh, uh, MP3 or something like that. And they are way different in terms of their uh, timing and volume signatures. So the other difference is in the way that you lay the circuit. We actually uh, lay the circuit, as I described, and end up with session keys. And then from then on out, we just use uh, symmetric crypto after that, because it's fast and does what we need. So another thing to keep in mind here, be, so I was talking on this slide about if R1 and R3 are both colluding, then we're screwed because of that traffic confirmation attack. One of the open research questions in the anonymity world is, can we make that traffic confirmation attack harder without adding so much extra padding that nobody's willing to do this? So uh, the extreme version is every Alice sends full rate padding into the network all the time, including when they're offline. Somehow we solve that. And then the network sends full rate padding to every possible Bob all the time. Uh, and it doesn't even make sense to send full padding to eBay. It doesn't know what padding is. So there are a lot of engineering questions there. But even if we could do something like that, we can imagine active attacks where somebody uh, delays Alice's traffic a little bit. And then rather than looking for presence, of spikes, now you look for absence of spikes. So it seems like it would be the same math uh, even in the case of full padding. So that's a, a, a question we, th we should think about more. The other question is, if in fact we're vulnerable to this end-to-end -end correlation attack, uh, 
then that means the security or anonymity or privacy from the Tor network comes from having as diverse a set of these relays as we can. So part of the goal here uh, is to have a lot of different relays in a lot of different places. Right now we're up to 2,500 relays in pretty much every continent. So the goal there is as we get more relays, the set of adversaries who's big enough to be able to compromise both sides should get smaller and smaller. So I can imagine that NSA has suborned enough American telcos to be able to watch a lot of the internet and therefore a lot of the Tor network, but maybe French intelligence uh, doesn't have that capability. But we shouldn't be looking at it just as the number of relays. Uh, we should be looking at it as the capacity because some relays are really fast and some are really slow. So Tor clients uh, automatically try to prefer the ones that are faster so they load balance. So we are uh, pushing something like one gigabyte per second of traffic uh, on the internet on average. And for those of you uh, who know networking professors, whenever I show them this graph, they freak out because if the capacity is anywhere near the amount of load on the network, then the network is going to have horrible performance problems. So that's uh, certainly something we've been wrestling with, but that's something for a different talk. Uh, we're actually doing reasonably well in terms of performance. Here's a graph of uh, how long it takes to fetch a 50 kilobyte file over Tor. Um, and right now we're quite stable around the three or four second mark. So that's, we're doing about as well as we can be doing at that point. And we've got uh, some graphs of users over time. The way we do this, I'll explain a little bit more later, but the way we do this is each of the Tor relays uh, sees who is connecting into the Tor network at it. They don't know what they're doing, but they can see where they're coming from. And we ship a GeoIP database with, with each one so it can convert the IP address that it sees into a country and start publishing statistics about that. Okay, so now on to the, the interesting stuff. Uh, how many people here uh, remember the Iran story from June of 2009 when they were all on the streets protesting? I see a couple of hands. Oh, I see many hands. Perfect. Okay. So our story starts in June of 2009 when we have basically nobody using Tor in Iran and then suddenly it spikes up to 8,000 people a day or something. Um, and it was, I think this is a pretty conservative number, actually. I was talking to the chief security officer of one of those large Web 2.0 companies um, who really didn't like Tor before this month, and then suddenly his big website got blocked in Iran, and then they were big fans of Tor because their users can use Tor to get to their website, and now they can connect to their social network and so on. And he was telling me that he was seeing 10,000 people a day connecting through Tor. So there were a lot of different people um, using Tor at this point in order to be safe. There were also a lot of people using plain text proxies, which worked great for June, and then in July they were all arrested, which is uh, an important lesson for us to learn about this sort of situation. So at the same time, I've got China graphed here, because all the Western newspapers were saying Iran, 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 and nobody was mentioning China. So the Let's see, I've got one of these. So this spike over here was June 4, or as they call it in China, May 35, because they can't actually say the phrase June 4 on their internet. So this is the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre, where there were a lot of people who were saying, um, I'd like to learn more about what this is, and I can't read about it on my network. But over here is where China blocked Google Search, Google Groups, Google Calendar, Google something else. And at that point, there were a lot of people who started out saying, I'm so glad my government keeps me safe on the internet, and then switched over to, holy cow, they're censoring Google. This is actual censorship. I need to learn how to get around it. So one of the neat things here is China has this habit of blocking a bunch of stuff as a show of power to say, remember that we're still in charge. And then they teach a whole lot of people how to use tools like Tor, and then they back off because a bunch of people are getting angry that Google is still blocked. So it's, they're sort of inoculating their populace against censorship, where they keep going this round over and over, where they teach more and more people and then back off. So there are a lot of people in China who know how Tor works at this point, which who knows if that will become relevant later. So that was the good news. Uh, Iran actually blocked Tor again. In, uh, let, me, let me back up. So that was the good news. Uh, it worked. Tor worked in Iran in 2009. But in January of this year, 
uh, Iran had caught up in terms of technology, and they'd figured out how to block things like Tor. Uh, so they bought some very fancy boxes from Nokia that do deep packet inspection, and they could recognize SSL flows. They basically have a knob to turn down the bandwidth that's allocated to SSL flows. And in January of this year, they figured out uh, how to actually recognize Tor flows on the wire. So there are a lot of different ways you can block Tor. The way that they did it was not at all what, what I was expecting. So they first do deep packet inspection to look for SSL flows. And then they, they search those flows for our Diffie-Hellman parameter P and block those flows. So boy, was that not what I was expecting them to do for their first attempt at blocking Tor. So that worked for a week or so in January. So here's a graph of the number of users uh, who were connecting to the Tor network over time in January. Um, the red dots are a seven-day moving average of, gosh, that's way lower than it should have been. And the blue dots are a seven-day rolling average of, that's higher than it looked like it was going to be. So we've got a, a blocking right there. The interesting thing here, so we fixed it in a week or two. And right here was when there was a huge uh, pile of people on the streets protesting. There had been a scheduled uh, protest, and Iran knew about it, so they worked really hard to block a, a bunch of different circumvention tools, and we managed to fix ours before that. So there were 60,000 people connecting to Facebook to figure out where they should be going, and then more than a million people coordinating out of that. So there were a lot of other tools that didn't recover in time, which means there are a lot of people in Iran right now who know a lot more about Tor than they did before. OK, so that was another sort of good news. We, we dealt with it. We fixed it. Here is uh, September 25, 2009. Here's one Tor relay uh, and how many users it was seeing from China. So basically, China uh, managed to block the entire Tor network by IP address. Um, and that was bad news. But let's take a step back. So how do you actually build one of these circumvention tools? There are actually two components to all these things. There's the relaying component, which is how do I build my paths? How do I get, how do I get my encryption right? How do I do flow control and all of that? And then there's the discovery component, which is what do I connect to? How do I learn about the network topology? And I've been mostly focusing on the relaying component so far. That's what Tor spent most of its time working on. But from the discovery side, we have a very simple uh, distributed directory system. So there are eight directory authorities, and each of them tries to, to figure out its own view of all the relays. And every hour, they publish a consensus, and they all sign it. And then all the clients get that consensus. And that means that all the clients have the same view of the network, which is necessary if you're trying to be anonymous together. Because if Alice 1 has one view of the network and Alice 2 has another view of the network, then you end up uh, being partitionable based on the choices that you make and the paths that you build. So we have this big central thing, um, and it works fine, except the consensus includes a list of all the IP addresses of all the relays. So the first way you can block Tor is you block those eight directory authorities. They're hard-coded in the Tor software. And that means that nobody can bootstrap. You download Tor, you run it, it tries to connect to one of these eight, it doesn't work, it gives up. Uh, and China did this in September 2009. The second way is you block all the IP addresses that are in that big list. China also did this in September 2009. Uh, the third way to block Tor is based on protocol fingerprint. For example, what Iran did in January 2011. Um, and then the, the last way is you block our website. So there are, for example, uh, torproject.org was blocked in Thailand for a long time. Uh, and it's blocked in a lot of different countries at this point. So there are a lot of people in Thailand who are saying, well, that was nice while Tor lasted, but the website's gone, so I assume the tool doesn't work anymore. And the, the program works fine, but you can't get to the website, so they give up. And we've got an email autoresponder where you email gettor at torproject.org from your Gmail account, and then we send you the Tor binary and you download it. So there are other ways of getting Tor, but it's really hard to communicate this to the people who need to know about it. So the fix that we have for all these different ways of blocking is what we call bridge relays. So the idea is we've got a bunch of users out there who are running Tor. We've got hundreds of thousands of users. What if we sign a few of them up as bridges or dark relays or hidden relays? And the idea is the user will connect through, the, the blocked user will connect through this bridge to the Tor network. And 
we've changed the arms race now. The, 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 the earlier game was, how do I give 2,000 public IP addresses to all of our users without China learning them, which is an impossible problem. The new arms race is, how do I take this list of bridge addresses and give them out one at a time to the good guys without letting the bad guys learn all of them? And that turns out to be a hard arms race, but it's at least a little bit ma more manageable. So how do you actually give out the bridges? Uh, there are four ways that we're giving them out right now, and we need more smarter ideas about this. So the first one is you go to the website, bridges.torproject.org, over HTTPS, and we look at where on the internet you're coming from, and we give you a few answers. So that means everybody's going to get a few bridges, but if you want to learn all of them, you have to come from a lot of different places around the internet. China also broke this one in September 2009. So they learned about our public IP addresses, and they enumerated all the bridges that they could find. Uh, but they didn't break the second one, which is you email bridges at torproject.org from your Gmail account, and then we send you a few. And if you want to learn a lot, <coughs> you have to make a lot of different Gmail accounts, which uh, Google has incentive to make hard, because they're already battling all the spammers and fishers and so on. So China actually waited until March 2010 to break this one. I don't know if they found it harder to break, or if they didn't notice it the first time around, uh, or if they felt like they did a good enough job uh, that they didn't need to break the rest of them. So from our perspective, we had two main ways of giving out bridges, and China blocked one of them, and then I'm like, oh dear, I've got only one left. Surely they're gonna break that one tomorrow. What do we do? We actually had a, a reserved set of bridges uh, which we hadn't given out to anybody. Our plan was, if everything goes bad, then we're going to quickly come up with a brilliant new bridge distribution design and then start using it. Uh, so at that point, I sent mail to a friend of mine in Shanghai and said, here are 40 bridges. Please do something smart with them. So he set up a password-protected Twitter account, signed up his 1,200 closest friends, and tweeted bridges every couple of hours. And those bridges had tens of thousands of users each. So there were a lot of people using uh, those bridges, which is good. I would have liked something a little bit uh, less centralized, but uh, at least the people who knew this guy could continue to have connectivity. So the third approach, uh, I mail this guy in Shanghai every day a new set of bridges, and he does something with them. Uh, I don't actually care what. He uses his social network somehow to answer people who need bridges. And then the fourth approach is you can run a bridge by yourself. You don't have to tell us. We don't give it out. You give it out. So we're working with a lot of uh, human rights groups in China and other places so to teach them how to run bridges for themselves and then give them to their users in country. So they've got a lot of members in the US who run bridges, tell those bridges to the nonprofit, and then the nonprofit shares them. And we've got nothing to do with that. So back to this story um, on that day, September 25. So they were actually blocking because October 1, 2009 was the 60th anniversary of some guy becoming in charge in China. So they really wanted to prepare for uh, whatever was going to happen by blocking a lot of different circumvention tools and censorship resistance tools and stuff like that. Uh, so they blocked a lot of things, but we'd already prepared for this. We knew it was easy to block Tor. So we'd already put out the bridge design. We translated into Chinese. We said, they're going to block Tor eventually. And when they do, here's what you do. You need to get a bridge. And the result was, over the course of a week, 30,000 people switched from using Tor directly to using a bridge. So that was, that was pretty cool. It felt like our, our first uh, little scuffle with China worked out pretty well. Um, unfortunately, we don't have enough bridges, and they don't change often enough, and we don't have smart enough ways of giving them out. So right now we've got maybe 800 bridge addresses, uh, and that means that most of the bridges are now known by China, at least the public ones. There are private ones that we don't know about which are doing better. Um, but in terms of the ones that we give out in an automated way, uh, bad news. So I started out saying, we need to get lots of bridges so China can't block them all. That was the wrong statement to make. The correct statement in retrospect was, we need the rate of change of our bridge addresses to exceed the rate that China can sustain blocking them. So it's about changing them over time. It's not about getting a lot and then hoping you have enough. 
Um, so another way of looking at that, when you're, when you're volunteering to run a relay for the Tor network, the primary property that you're, you're contributing is bandwidth. The more capacity you have, the better you are for the network. But when you're volunteering to run a bridge for the Tor network, the primary property that you're donating is your IP address. And if you have one, and China's pretty good at learning them, then they're going to learn that one, and then you won't really be very helpful anymore. So we'll get back to that one in a few more slides also. Okay, so what else is going on? Uh, does everybody know about the whole Middle Eastern, Tunisia, Egypt? I hope you've been reading the news over the past couple of months. Sounds good. So these blue dots up here are when you were reading about Tunisia in the news. There were a lot of people in Tunisia who were saying, uh, something's going on, maybe I want some safety, uh, my friend just got disappeared, I want to be able to learn what's going on and tell people what's going on in a way that keeps me a little bit more safe. And then there's Egypt, which, uh, so this right here is when they blocked Facebook in Egypt. And then there were thousands of people who said, I'm going to get to Facebook through various circumvention tools. Uh, and some of them decided that Tor was a good one because they would be kept safe. Um, here is when they shut off the whole internet in Egypt. Uh, <laughs> and then my favorite part is this baseline here is twice what it was before. So there are a lot of people in Egypt now who've learned that in fact, maybe they do want some safety or protection from people monitoring what they're doing. And then Libya is uh, not quite as uh, pleasant a picture. So nobody actually wrote about Libya turning off their internet. So Egypt turned off their internet by actually making phone calls to all the ISPs and having them actually like unplug things. Whereas Libya just strangled their internet to the point that it wasn't worth using anymore. And that wasn't uh, as exciting an article to write for Western uh, journalists, so nobody really noticed that. And it might be recovering a little bit over here. I think they're turning a little bit back on, but bad news for Libya in general. And then Syria, we've been reading about them recently. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen there, but generally uh, a spike like this tells me something about what's going to be going on in a country. And this little blip right here was actual censorship. Uh, there were one of the ISPs in Syria figured out how to block Tor by protocol, so we were hearing from a lot of users. I think that it had something to do with our SSL handshake, and we try to look like Firefox talking to Apache, but we don't do it perfectly. So that means that if they examine the SSL handshake, they can figure out this is not Firefox, this is Tor. So there was one ISP that figured out how to do that, and it was doing that for four or five days, and we were really worried that it was going to spread, and then that whole ISP fell off the internet, and when it came back, it wasn't censoring Tor anymore. So I have no idea what was going on there, but we'll see if we can learn any lessons from that. Okay, so let's take a step back here. Uh, I talked to a lot of computer scientists who ha misunderstand the threat from uh, large foreign sensors. Uh, so one of the, the key things to keep in mind, if you read the wrong thing on the internet, they're not going to kick down your door and say, you read the Wikipedia article on democracy, you're coming with me. So if you wrote the Wikipedia article on democracy, yeah, that's another story. But there are a lot of people out there who read things. Uh, the worst that, that the Chinese firewall does, if you read something you shouldn't have read, is they say, oops, and then they fix their censorship. Then they, they start to block it. Uh, they don't start rounding up people who read the wrong thing. Uh, at the same time, censors have a, an economic, political, social incentive not to block the whole internet. So I started this thinking, if I make China turn off their internet, did I win or did I lose? And the answer is China is not going to turn off their internet. They've got too much at stake. Uh, but there are collateral damage situations. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was somebody in India who read some blog post from Pakistan, and it was, it was religious, and the, the fellow in India said, we have to censor this blog post or we're going to have a war on our hands. So the guy in India sent mail to the seven major ISPs in India saying, can you block this uh, web page for us so that ev everybody will stay peaceful? And so they, they blocked the web page, and everybody was happy, except it, it turns out that the web page they blocked was a little domain that they didn't know much about called Blogspot, which meant that they blocked 8 million blogs for a week. And there were a lot of people in India saying, wait a minute, I live in a democracy. I thought I, thought I was free here. How are they censoring the internet? That's a story I hear over and over. I remember uh, long ago getting email from people in Thailand who were saying they blocked torproject.org. I live in a free country. I'm going to sue. 
and then a few years later the tanks roll and it turns out that maybe not quite as free as they thought. So part of the interesting side there is that uh, we can use whether our website gets blocked as an early warning system to figure out whether there's going to be uh, political or social change in the country. Okay, so what are we actually up against? Once upon a time I was saying, okay, it's me against the Chinese government. I can handle this. And it turns out not to be that because the folks who built the Chinese firewall are an American company called Cisco. Now, they don't still run it because China managed to uh, figure out how to build better routers uh, for their purposes. But the people who run the Syrian firewall are an American company called WebSense. The folks who run the Saudi Arabian firewall, I don't remember which one, but it's Smart Filter or Cisco or WebSense. Um, there was a company called Fortinet that built the firewall for Burma, and then Cisco outcompeted them. So part of the challenge here is that it's me against 2,000 PhDs at Cisco who are trying to figure out how to censor employees of American companies better. So Syria can't actually afford to buy this stuff. If Syria goes to Cisco and says, build us a censorship system, Cisco is going to say, that'll be a couple hundred million dollars, and Syria will say, I can't afford that, never mind, we don't need it. But the problem is that Boeing goes to Cisco and says, we need a censorship system for our employees. We need to keep them from reading news at work. And then Cisco builds it. And then afterwards, Cisco is happy to sell it to Syria or whoever else out there wants to buy it. So I was talking to Whit Diffie about this a year ago or something. And he was explaining, it's simple. You make two categories. You make the category of companies that are willing to sell stuff to, to, company, to countries that they shouldn't sell it to. And then you make a list of the people who aren't willing to sell their stuff to countries. And then you publicize both lists. And that way, everybody can choose. Let, let the market decide. That might work, but the second list is empty. There are no companies <laughs> that won't sell to any country that's happy to buy this stuff. So I don't know how to deal with this. I mean, the US State Department has rules against selling this stuff to certain countries, but uh, nobody actually enforces them. Um, I mean, how did Iran get its stuff from Nokia? The answer is they went through a European distributor, which is totally fine. So there are so many loopholes at this point. I'm not really sure uh, from a societal pressure perspective how we can resolve this particular problem. Okay, so there are a bunch of other topics to cover, but I'm going to skip over some of them. Uh, for example, Tor provides anonymity, meaning nobody knows where your packets are coming from or going to. But if you write your name in your blog post, we can't help you. And there are a lot more subtle examples of that, where you put cookies and you can be recognized by them. Or you go to a website and they look through your browser history. Um, or every time you go to a website, uh, Internet Explorer sends exactly how many pixels by how many pixels your browser window is so the website can figure out how to display stuff to you best. So all of these are ways to track you over time. We have a Firefox extension called Tor Button that tries to block a lot of these without making your life too miserable, which brings me to Flash. So Flash is, uh, there are a bunch of different plugins, but in general, you go to a website, it gives you a flash applet, which is an arbitrary binary blob. The flash applet roots around on your hard drive, finds some interesting documents, figures out your IP address, sends it back over Tor. Tor is doing its job. Tor is anonymously sending your IP address back to the website that sent you the flash applet. That might not be what you want. So the fix that we have is no flash for you, which is especially frustrating because if you're in Turkey and they block YouTube, and you install Tor so that you can get to YouTube, and then Tor button turns off Flash to keep you safe, something's gone wrong there. So there's, there's a definite uh, competition contradiction between uh, usability and security in that case. Uh, but it gets worse. Did you know that Microsoft Word is a networking application? If I embed an image link with enough backslashes, it turns into a net BIOS call that goes out uh, immediately to the network to fetch that image. So if somebody downloads a doc file over Tor safely, and then they click, click it, and that's the end of their privacy, security, anonymity. Um, so I mean, we hear stories about the Chinese government sending this sort of thing to Tibetan activists. Um, so the very short answer is don't use Flash, don't use Windows, don't use any of these other dangerous things. Uh, but that, that answer doesn't work very well for most of our users. So that's a, another discussion. 
So there are a bunch of different ways to install it. There are basically two safe ways to use Tor at this point. There's the Tor browser bundle, which comes with Firefox and Tor button and everything. It's standalone. You can stick it on a USB key. You walk into an internet cafe and you use it, and then you close it and you walk away, and it doesn't leave very many traces. Um, and the other approach is a live CD where you have your own operating system. Everything's pre-configured to keep you safe. It doesn't have Windows or Word or Flash. And whatever you do, hopefully, will remain safe. OK, so I talk to a lot of users who say, I'm using Tor, so I'm totally safe, right? Um, and there are a lot of other things that you have to keep in mind. There's the application level stuff, like cookies and history. But there are a bunch of other assumptions that we have to make about our users. For example, if you have spyware installed or a keyboard logger or something like that, then we can't help you. Uh, for the extreme example of that is if you're lucky enough to be using the internet in North Korea, there's a guy standing over your shoulder with a machine gun watching you type. So my software is not going to help you in that situation because they're going to see what you're doing. Uh, there was another, there was a law in Beijing a little while ago that says every seat at the internet cafe has to have a video camera watching the screen. So if you're in that situation, I also can't help you. I'm told that one's not so bad because the first person who walks in in the morning reaches up and turns it away and nobody ever turns it back. So, I mean, maybe that's okay, but that's another situation where you need to think a little bit harder about this. Uh, so I was, I was doing a training for a bunch of folks in Vietnam a while ago, and I showed up to teach them about uh, PGP and Tor and off-the-record messaging and 128-bit good, 40-bit bad, uh, things like that. And they were uh, getting phone calls in the audience saying, so-and-so just got arrested, what should we do? And it, it quickly became clear that I should be teaching them OPSEC, operational security, rather than InfoSec. Uh, and that's not something that Tor is particularly well suited for. So they were telling me really horrible stories like, I go to the bathroom and they break into my house and answer my Skype calls. So yes, I use encrypted Skype, but we still have to have some informal protocol afterwards where we ask a question that the other guy ought to know, and sometimes the other guy doesn't know the answer. Um, or they steal my laptop and install new hardware and software. Can you take a look at it? Or there's a guy across the street with a parabolic microphone listening to everything I say. So yes, I use encrypted Skype, but that's not going to do it for me. Um, and so we actually finally tracked down one of the ways that uh, these folks were being monitored. Um, so they had laptops that were, they were pretty sure were being monitored somehow, but we couldn't find the root kit. We couldn't find the back door. And eventually there was a, an instance where there were seven Vietnamese activists, and one of them PGP encrypted mail to the other six and sent it, and the plain text of it got published in the national newspaper the next day. And so everybody's like, is there a mole? Is PGP broken? What's going on here? Um, and it turns out that Windows doesn't ship with Vietnamese keyboard driver support by default. So if you want to use Vietnamese with Windows, you go to the same place everybody else goes, and you download the Vietnamese keyboard driver, and you install it. it turns out that the Vietnamese Secret Service has backdoored the keyboard driver that every Windows user uses. So if you're using Vietnamese on Windows, you are part of the Vietnamese Secret Service botnet. So they get to watch people and read their mail and whatever else they want to do. So that's another situation where I can't solve that. Another situation that I can't solve how do you know you really have Tor? So you go to torproject.org. If you can do the SSL thing, great. You can make sure that you're talking to the website unless uh, the CAs are broken or unless somebody's lying to you or all sorts of other problems. So the very short answer is whenever I do a talk, I find people and, and say, here's my business card, and it's got my PGP key on it. And that means that you can uh, download the software, download my key, check the signature, make sure that it's, the, it's actually the authentic software. And if you understood that sentence, you are all set. But none of them understand that sentence, so I'm not sure what to go, where to go from there. And even if they do understand the sentence, so I've given my business card to maybe 10,000, 15,000 people in the US and Europe. And I've given my business card to maybe 1,000 people in China. I hear they have more people than that. So I, I don't know how to solve this problem, because they're going to end up downloading Yellow Dog Tour or something like that. And the only thing from my perspective is they're going to send me mail saying, it's great, Tor works again, and it's faster than ever. I love it. And they won't be using Tor at all. So I don't know how to solve that. OK, another challenge. Publicity attracts attention. 
Uh, so a lot of circumvention tools start off going to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and saying, uh, we're, we're going to deploy this fantastic new thing. It's going to be great. Nobody's ever going to be able to block us. Their website gets blocked before they've written a line of code. Because, so from the, from the sensor's perspective, there are two reasons that they want to block something. One of them is it's working really well. So everybody knows about it, and they have to regain control in the, in the minds of their populace. Or it is threatening them in terms of appearance of control. So the way that the Chinese firewall works, as I understand it, is the directive from on high is don't embarrass us. And that means every ISP has some poor technical guy who's like, don't embarrass us. What does that mean? What am I supposed to block? And that's why you've got a lot of variation on blocking from one ISP to the next. And the more you have articles in the Western press about things like Tor, the more likely it is that the, the policy people are going to read those and say, so I just read that Tor works. What are you doing about that? So part of our strategy is to avoid having popular articles like that. And that means that they don't get any pressure uh, from above. So we were talking to the folks who run the firewall in Bahrain. And they use Tor, so they don't want to block it. So their, their job is to keep their job without you know, doing too much uh, to ruin the internet. Most technical people don't like censorship, even the folks who operate firewalls. OK, so there was another uh, fuss a couple of years ago where Hal Roberts from the Berkman Center ended up doing a blog post where he was looking at a different circumvention tool, and he found their frequently asked questions list. And one of the questions was, do you sell user data? And the answer was, paraphrased, yes. And the more you pay, the more fine-grained the data is. And there was a big fuss, because a lot of their users are like, hey, I'm using you as a circumvention tool. Surely you're keeping me safe. And the answer was, we're a circumvention tool. What does that have to do with safety? We let you reach BBC. Of course we log everything and sell it. How, how else can we make money? So there's, there's a, a big clash right now between various designs where, from Tor's perspective, if you're going to let somebody get around censorship, you need to do it in a safe way so that nobody can figure out uh, en masse who's doing it. But there are a lot of other VPNs and other stuff that, are, um, that only focus on the circumvention side. Australia sensors, New Zealand sensors, England sensors, Denmark sensors, Sweden's working on censoring. There's a US government uh, law that tries to get pushed through each year to censor. Canada's working on censoring. So there are a couple of problems here. The first one is when the US State Department goes to China and says, you're a bad government because you censor the internet, then they turn around and say, we're just keeping our citizens safe just like everybody else does. England keeps their citizens safe. How come you aren't picking on them? So part of the challenge here is pretty much uniformly the way this works is uh, the government decides they need to censor something bad on the internet. So they build a censorship infrastructure. And then they have some sort of quasi-government organization in charge of deciding what people in that country aren't allowed to look at. And they start out with a pretty small list. And then they end up putting more stuff on it. And then there's a new politician in power. And he's like, I've got this headache from this organization. And if I just put it on the list, then it'll go away. My headache will go away. So the list grows and grows. I was in Australia a while ago. And um, they have a dentist website on their censorship list. And I think the way that it happened was he had malware on his website. Somebody broke in. Somebody put something on it. So they decided to put the website on the censorship list. Turns out there's no way to get off the censorship list. They never bothered thinking about that side of the equation. Because clearly, we'll only put bad things on the, web, on the censorship list. So there's a, a group in England called the Internet Watch Foundation. And they sent me mail a while ago. They're, they're the group in charge of building the UK censorship list. And the mail that they sent was not what I was expecting. A lot of people would say, you know, surely they're trying to hassle you into either giving up your users or disappearing or something. Their question was, how can we make Tor faster? And that's because they use Tor to check out the internet. Uh, a bunch of websites have realized that if you're coming from the Internet Watch Foundation's IP address, you don't give them the stuff they're looking for. <laughs> so they need an anonymity tool in order to be able to do their job. OK, so there are, there are a bunch of different uh, advocacy and education sides of this. 
Um, I spend a lot of time in DC talking to policy people to try to teach them about the internet and security and stuff like that. Uh, and once I'm done teaching them, they go get a better job, which makes this particularly challenging. So part of what we need to do is teach a bunch of law enforcement and journalists and other policy people uh, about bad stuff on the internet and bad policies they're heading towards. Uh, that's also a separate talk. We have uh, an eager from NSF to uh, figure out how to collect uh, statistics about the Tor network and its usage in a way that doesn't hurt users and then give everybody the data, those graphs that I was showing you before uh, come from that sort of thing. Um, so we've got a bunch of data that nobody's really looking at um, and we have some algorithms for making sure that it's safe that nobody has really evaluated. So I'd love to chat with you more about that um, to see if you can de-anonymize our users uh, or something like that. Okay, so Technical solutions are not going to solve the whole problem here. The problem in China is that a lot of the people there say, I'm so glad my government keeps me safe on the internet. So it's not about building a better sensor circumvention tool until everybody's free. You need to change society as well. And there are plenty of people in China who are working on that. I remember long ago, I was, uh, there was some journalist of the San Jose Mercury News who uh, called me up and her question was, so how are you doing against China? And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I'm writing software. There are people in China who know how China should change. I have no idea how China should change. It's, it's not up to me. It shouldn't be up to me. I provide tools to let other people around the world change the world in the way that, that they think it should be changed. So at the same time, those people need some sort of uh, security while they're doing it. Uh, you guys should all run relays. Uh, every relay has an exit policy that lets you uh, decide whether you're going to allow web browsing or other stuff. So if you run a non-exit relay, all you're doing is contributing bandwidth and making the world a better place. You're at a university. You're in a perfect position for doing that. Okay, so what are some of the, the technical stuff that we're messing with uh, towards the end of the talk? So we've got this bridge distribution system. So we've got 800 bridge addresses. And we've got those four strategies I was talking about through HTTPS or Gmail or I send it to a guy in Shanghai. Step one, we need to figure out how much use each bridge is seeing. And we're actually doing that right now because the bridges ship with the GeoIP uh, Geo database and they publish, I saw this many users from China, this many users from Tunisia, this many users from Egypt. Step two, we need to figure out when the bridges are blocked. That turns out to be harder than it sounds because we need to learn at what point this bridge is no longer reachable from some IP address that I can't easily test from. But once we've got those two, then we can imagine having a bunch of different distribution strategies. We've got the email one or the website one or a guy in Berkeley or a guy in Shanghai or a guy over here and you can sign up to be a distribution strategy. And then we can start coming up with metrics where we say, um, if your bridge doesn't get blocked for a long time and it has a lot of use, then that, that distribution strategy scores a 10. But if it gets blocked quickly or doesn't get much use, then it scores a 2. So we can start adaptively rewarding the strategies that work well and dynamically give out more, more bridges, more addresses to the ones that are more efficient. Uh, I could imagine that we could start automatically recognizing which individuals are good at getting bridges into the hands of the right people. Um, so we need more bridge addresses. We need them to change more often. We need better distribution strategies. Uh, and I was talking to Dan Bonet about a design that we're working on called Flash Bridges. The idea is uh, you get a bunch of users around the world to go to a website. It gives them a flash badge, which is a little program that turns them into a bridge. So at that point, we would have millions of users running bridges, but for very short periods of time, um, which produces lots of open research questions, which is exactly what Dan is excited about. So measuring re bridge reachability, uh, there are a bunch of different ways, but I'll have to cover that one afterwards. Other stuff to think about, traffic camouflaging. So right now, we try to look like SSL on the wire. We try to look like an actual SSL handshake. But we can't be exactly like SSL because Firefox uses the libNSS library, whereas we use OpenSSL, which means that we're going to be offering a different set of cipher suites and other stuff that can make us distinguishable. So right now, we've been working on hacking OpenSSL to make it pretend to be looking like Firefox. Uh, that arms race sucks. We're, we're losing it. 
So the next step is what would happen if we ship another proxy that adds another layer of encryption on top so that we just look like complete encrypted garbage out of the gate. So there's no handshake at all. For the, the simple intuition is Alice sends some bytes, Bob sends some bytes, you XOR them, that's your session key, and then you talk from there. Um, so at that point, the deep packet inspection tools aren't going to work anymore. Is that going to be enough to win the arms race for a while? What other, so the next step is let's try to actually look like HTTP. We can imagine some distribution of what people looking like HTTP would be. Maybe we put our message in the cookie. Maybe we uh, do some sort of binary thing. Maybe we hide it steganographically. Um, there's a question about how much efficiency and overhead we can have there. But at the same time, we need obfuscation metrics. So if I give you five different encoders, which all claim to be unblockable by uh, some Cisco box, how do we actually decide which one is better, which one is worse? So those are uh, some more topics to cover. And I've got a couple of graphs at the end just to uh, raise some unknown questions. So here's a big spike of people in Ghana a few weeks ago that were using Tor. For some reason, it ramped up, and then it cliffed. Did they censor Tor? I don't think so. There's some political event that happened. I have no idea what's going on. So if you know what was going on in Ghana, uh, please let me know. At the same time, we've got Chile, where it spikes up and then goes down. Uh, so thousands of people were using Tor for some reason a couple of weeks ago in Chile. And we've got Venezuela that looks the same, but it takes a lot longer to fall off. I have no idea what's going on in these various countries, but we've got graphs of interesting events where tour usage goes up or down. Uh, so if you uh, know how to they have protests, they have protests. Yeah. okay, quite plausible. Ideally, we should figure out some way to automatically map something going on in the country, maybe in Google News, to these graphs. That would be really cool. Pardon? OK, so I am 25 seconds out of time. And I think we have four minutes left or something for questions, or should we let them go to lunch? Uh, I, I think we should take questions. Let's okay. first thank our speaker. <laughs> I'd ask that if you do questions? have questions, could you please come up to the microphone to ask it? That would be fantastic, because there's a lot of echo in here. Uh, you'll have to route it through your neighbor. <laughs> Roger, can you tell us a few words about relation between Tor Project and WikiLeaks? Ooh, a few words about the relation between Tor Project and WikiLeaks. Uh, so the very short answer there is Tor Project and WikiLeaks are not the same organization. Uh, Tor writes software, which a lot, of or a lot of different people around the world use, including WikiLeaks. So WikiLeaks made use of Tor um, it was the recommended way of safely getting stuff to the, tour, to the WikiLeaks website. So part of the challenge there was a lot of journalists really wanted to mush them together. So we got a lot of calls over and over saying, uh, hi, we're from the New York Times. Can you give us a statement about WikiLeaks? And then we had to explain, actually, maybe you should talk to the WikiLeaks people if you would like a statement about WikiLeaks. So hopefully that answers that. There was a case a few years back where somebody added his own relay to Tor and, and found a lot of Iraqi, Iranian embassy pass, passwords. Can you comment? Yes, so the embassy password thing. So a couple of years ago, there was a guy in Sweden who went to as many journalists as he could find and said, I have hacked the internet. It's great, and I'm not going to tell you how I did it. So then all the journalists had to produce newspaper articles saying, Swedish hacker breaks internet, brilliant hacker won't say how. And then a week later, he went to all the journalists again and said, I did it by running a Tor exit relay. And it turns out that not all the Tor, not all the Tor users use end-to-end -end encryption. So I could see their password when they were logging into their pop server or something like that. And then all the journalists were forced to produce another round of publicity. Uh, brilliant Swedish hacker uh, snoops Tor network, learns passwords. Uh, and he ended up winning, I think he won like the Hacker of the Year Award in Australia. And that same day that he won that award, he got arrested in Sweden and all his stuff got taken by the Swedish law enforcement. I was meeting with Swedish law enforcement, um, I, I guess it was a year ago or something, and I was asking them about this case and they didn't want to specify because it's an ongoing case. 
So the very short version is if you are planning to wiretap the internet and then publicly talk about it, maybe you should chat with a lawyer first. Uh, so that, that's the short version. I was actually uh, chatting with some other people in Sweden. Apparently this guy is well known and well hated in Sweden. He signed up for the Swedish Pirate Party and then he called up law enforcement and said, I'm your man on the inside. Uh, except Sweden's actually kind of small, so Swedish law enforcement called up the Pirate Party and said, apparently we have a man on the inside? <laughs> so <laughs> that, yeah, I, d I don't think that he's doing too well socially in his community. Other questions? Uh, are there any analysis on uh, what sort of uh, traffic is on uh, the exit servers? I um, was on the privacy enhancing technologies conference once and I got uh, one uh, opinion from a p person who ran a relay uh, which uh, seemed to be pretty biased uh, and uh, he said that uh, he had run uh, the proxy for a few months and uh, looked at uh, what was going on um, and said that it was almost all pornography and especially uh, much child pornography. Uh, but, um, well, the, I know uh, I, I work in privacy domain, so if field, I don't, I'm not against uh, Tor at all. Uh, um, but um, I, I think some people has uh, such an opinion, uh, even on the community. Uh, and uh, well, I, I want to know what was your opinion, or if you have some data, more large data on, on this subject. So the first answer is the median connection over Tor is web browsing, and the median byte over Tor is file sharing. So that leads us to a performance discussion about how do you squeeze down the file sharer so there's space left on the network for other people. In terms of what people are doing, nobody's actually done a, a formal study on that, mainly because there are wiretapping laws uh, or the EU has its own equivalent of that. So you can't really look at what's coming out of your exit relay without breaking the law. Uh, so the, uh, uh, we've got anecdotes. We've heard from lots of different people who are using Tor for various uh, good reasons. Um, I've also heard from the FBI Innocent Images Unit that they use Tor in order to try to hunt down bad people. So I've heard from a lot of different law enforcement groups that need systems like Tor in order to be able to do their job catching child pornographers. Uh, but that's certainly a, a longer discussion that uh, we could have later. My, my very short answer is let me tell you about all the good uses of Tor. If you want to make bad people disappear from the internet, that seems like a hard challenge to do. For the first couple of thousand users, they were all technical people for Tor, but now that we've got hundreds of thousands of users in Tor, we have a snapshot of the internet. It's sort of a, a cross-section of the internet. Yes, uh, sorry, can I do a, a, a small follow-up on the question? Uh, in fact, it's just, um, as, as you say, the, well, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, thorough and uh, scientific study of what is going on and I uh, just had an um, idea of uh, I mean like like great percentage I mean there is interesting things nobody doubts about it but uh, it's more about what is the percentage the, the part the share of the interesting thing and what is the share of uh, other things I have mentioned pornography or whatever um, you, you have had probably more as small stories and opinions than anyone, and uh, your estimation on uh, the share of each uh, thing. I think I most of the tour traffic is ordinary people in the US and Europe who read newspaper articles about NSA wiretaps America, or they read newspaper articles about uh, US government agency loses 30 million names, addresses, credit card numbers, and they say, oh my gosh, I need to find a way to be safer on the internet. Here's this tour thing, I'm gonna use it. So I think the way that we get to hundreds of thousands of users is by having almost all of them be ordinary citizens caring about civil liberties and freedom from being stuck in some huge corporate database and then lost. So. I suggest we continue our uh, discussions over lunch and let's thank our speaker again thank for you. his wonderful talk.